Okay, Psych 250 students continuing with Chapter 10, Substance Related and Other Addictive Disorders. We were talking about the case study of Crazy Indian Woman. When I told the daughter that her strong reaction to her boyfriend's supposed infidelity, I asked her if it might have something to do with her mother, she was perplexed. She uh, questioned, why would you say that? <clears throat> I said, well, why don't you just think about it and we can talk about it later. Um, that's called dropping the bomb in therapy. You know, you just plant a seed, let people fester with it a little bit, put it in the crock pot, let it cook for a while. Later I saw her, a week or so later, and she said, you know, I was thinking about what you said. <coughs> and she thought that it might have something to do with her mom. This notion of growing up, having to kind of have incredible uncertainty, first feeling abandoned by her father, but certainly being feeling abandoned by her mother, who was still in the household, but not really living with alcoholic mother and sort of playing the part of mother, which is not what kids should be doing. And so this thought that she had that her boyfriend might be cheating on her produced a lot of that anger that maybe she wasn't able to express freely with her father or her mother. So I encouraged her to seek some help, and she said that she would. I call that story Crazy Indian Woman, and I'll leave it up to you to decide which one am I talking about? Opioids are a problem, have been a problem, continue to be a problem. Why? Um, well, we go back to Sigmund Freud's time, and he as well as anybody, had access to cocaine. It was placed in Coca-Cola at the time. Uh, he tried it, gave him energy, kept him up at night so he could get more writing done. He distributed to his friends, thought it was the wonder drug. Today, we have problems with individuals who have been prescribed different opioids. Um, and they quickly found out that they can be very addictive to some. And of course, anytime people want something and they can't get it, that opens up the so-called black market. People can find a way to get it. Find a way to get it. Sedatives, hypnotics, like barbiturates, have been with us also for quite a bit of time. I mentioned, um, last chapter, I mentioned Captain America and his shield, right? Well, guess what? This notion of a super soldier creating someone that didn't need that much sleep, super energy, very aggressive. This was a program that different countries worked on, and barbiturates were part of that program to make these super warriors. <coughs> Question with, you've seen these advertisements over and over again with methamphetamines. Do people know how much they've deteriorated? And the answer is kind of mixed. It's kind of like um, having a kid, and your relative comes over and says, oh my God, your, your child has grown so much. And they're like, really? Uh, it's a gradual process. Then when you think of it, it's like, yeah, I guess I have changed a lot. You know, when it comes to substances, people don't care. Sometimes we'll challenge a substance abuser and we'll say, look, you make a choice. Either it's going to be the substance or me. Well, I can tell you right now, you're setting yourself up for failure because substance usually wins. And it's not that they don't care about you. It's just that 
they could have what I like to think of as a double whammy. Psychological dependence on the substance, their brain thinks they need it. Physiological dependence on the substance, their, their body craves it. And if they don't get it, there's a problem. Now, students in particular are guilty, just like professors, of using stimulants, right? And I mentioned the aspects of caffeine quite a bit. We have to do all this work. We've got to watch these videos. We've got to take these notes. You expect us to do that in 24 hours, plus all the other obligations we have? Work and school. Family obligations. So caffeine has been with us for quite some time. <coughs> you get it in many different forms, uh, including one of our favorites, chocolate. So it's become the norm, and I always tease people as if the biggest drug pusher is usually within a mile away. And you know the name of the drug pusher I'm talking about, Starbucks. It's not Starbucks. It's another uh, chain that will get us our drugs when we need them. And we do need them. Freud quickly realized after one of his colleagues died of an overdose mixing cocaine and another substance, that maybe this was a substance that people shouldn't be taking, not everybody. He stopped taking it, and he urged his friends, uh, ignore what I said before, this is not the wonder substance. And there are folks that can use it and abuse a substance, let go of it, and go on to make pretty good careers in themselves. Sigmund Freud is an example. Um, Barack Obama, former president of the United States, wrote about his cocaine use early in his life. Goes on to be president. Now, I'm not trying to say if you use cocaine, you'll be the father of a major perspective of psychology or be, go on to become president, but I'm saying that all these substances don't have to destroy a person's life. Now, Timothy Leary, who was at Harvard, argued that hallucinogens would be the way to tap into the mind's potential. And his colleagues pretty much drummed him out of the school. So he made his way to different parts of the country, including Laguna Beach, California, and promoted the use of hallucinogens, tapping into that potential. Um, he's been written off for quite a bit of time, and only recently have we kind of gone back to looking at hallucinogens as possible treatments for a variety of disorders. So <clears throat> never say never when it comes to substances, that's for sure. Nicotine. At one point, um, doctors recommended cigarettes as a way to calm yourself. <coughs> Sigmund Freud himself smoked over 20 cigars a day. Uh, there was pretty wide knowledge that the use of nicotine products would eventually lead to cancer, even back in Freud's day. But it's highly addictive. Uh, people used to smoke on planes. People used to smoke freely any location, right? In our own classrooms, people could smoke in the classroom. They used to have ashtrays all over the place. And I can just imagine as a professor at the time, if I was teaching at that time, uh, saying, I think there's a question over there in the classroom, but I can't quite see the student, right? So uh, our country has changed drastically. And the tobacco firms uh, throughout their disconnected misrepresentation of the data uh, have kind of given up their focus on the United States and turned to other countries where uh, tobacco abuse is alive and well. If anything, the tobacco companies have invested heavily uh, in other forms of nicotine use, for example, vaping. Marijuana in my lifetime has made a drastic turn uh, from something that would completely destroy you to now states kind of looking at the possibility of getting quite a bit of money from the taxes of sales. <clears throat> Some young kids have had the experience of abusing inhalants as one of the first 
connections, either by accident or on purpose, spray painting a um, plastic model they're doing, opening up a can of gasoline, inhaling the fumes, and then realizing, oh my goodness, this makes me feel weird. I think I'll try that again. Okay. So the list goes on and on for substances. But one of the things that we mentioned before is the addictive personality. If an individual is prone to be hooked on substances, guess what? They can get off that substance very much like the mother in the crazy Indian story, case study, and turn to other substances, or they can turn to other addictive behaviors, for example, gambling. I always love those advertisements for Las Vegas, you know. If you have a gambling problem, please call this number, you know, and the print's really small. <clears throat> the part of the brain that goes for gambling is very similar to the part of the brain that needs a substance. You need to get that reinforcement going. And this is not limited to going to casinos. It could be just playing online. And of course, the games are rigged against you, so you're not likely to win. But the, as B.F. Skinner would say, it just, just partial reinforcement is enough to keep that brain engaged, right? And so you want more, and you want more, and you want more, just like our substances, just like with gambling. And with internet, you're at you're at home. You can just keep on loading up your credit card and voila, destruction of your life, very much so like with a substance. Let's go over the reviews for this chapter. And of course, you already know one of the questions is going to be on the crazy Indian woman case study and your determination as to which, if any, of the women mentioned in this case study was so-called crazy. And if they were, what kind of diagnosis do you think they might get? The last question deals with gambling and binge drinking disorders. How are they alike? How are they different? Hope you learned a few things. I'm looking forward to the next chapter. Take care.